We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon. I had access to all the bands, not only because of Rolling well, With Rolling Stones, in the beginning, we needed them as much as they needed us. Put it this way, they needed us as much as we needed them. So if they were disinclined to get the picture taken, they suddenly became inclined because they wanted to be in the pages of Rolling Stones. All right, so I got one of the greats here. How did I get you? I'm just so thrilled today to have you here, Baron Woolman, who really is an iconic image in the world of photography. So, and since I've had Andy Smith on the podcast and Terry Atherton, both of you who you know very well, this is a nice little piece of the puzzle to fit into that. Thank you, man. Thanks <laughs> for the compliment. I, I mean, I've shown my pictures at both of their galleries. Um, it was, I was telling you this story. It's really interesting. Um, when I first came to Santa Fe in 2001, I stayed under the radar. And then I decided, okay, it's time to <laughs> let people know that I'm here. <laughs> so Baron I got here. together with Andy, and we had this show. And what was really cool, you know, across from his old gallery mm -hmm. was Evangelos Bar. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had a, bar, a band set up in the bar. And so and all my stuff is rock and roll, right? And they were, they were cover band. They could cover anything. So the people would look at the, at the pictures across the street, hear the music, <laughs> have a drink, come back and look at the picture. <laughs> that was really, really fun. It was a great way to introduce myself <laughs> to Santa Fe. And, and for those people who might not recognize the name yet, you were one of the two, really kind of the two official photographers at Woodstock, well, right? Well... Semi-official. I mean... The word official is, is, should not be used. The only one who is really official, who was hired by Henry Dills, I mean, it was Henry Dills. He was hired by Michael Lang to cover it. He got there very early, and he covered everything from the building. He stayed to the very last minute. Henry and Michael were very good friends. So he, I say he was a, the official photographer. Elliot Landy says that he was a fish, official photographer. I do not say I was the official. <laughs> yeah, but official. there was only two guys that were kind of allowed on the backstage, right, to, to do the photography. Is that true? Yeah, well, Henry, of course, was. And you. And I and Jim Marshall. Yeah, yeah. And so and we're, as we're recording this, the 50th anniversary is in like, what, three days maybe? Yeah, it's coming up, Isn't man. That amazing? I mean, actually, interestingly enough, today is Monday of that anniversary week. By Tuesday and Wednesday, the people were coming already, and the stage wasn't finished. And that's so, so for those going back to Memory Lane, we're talking 1969 in Upper New York, and the word gets out, right? The counterculture people say, hey, we're, there's, a, there's a concert. It's not supposed to be a free concert either. You're supposed to buy and pay tickets. Well, they did sell 180,000 tickets, and they told the people, <laughs> they told the locals, oh, it was going to be a concert, only 50,000 but they had already sold 180. <laughs> so they knew anyway. Yeah, I mean, they knew what they were doing, and they were afraid to put out the real numbers for fear that the government, the local governments would say, oh, no way, man, we cannot handle that many people. Yeah, and they probably would have. They probably would have shut it down. Well, they tried. They did try anyway. They, they even tried at the, at the final site, and, uh, you know, they just didn't have the time to do it. Fortunately. Yeah, because the original site, the city council, Woodstock, cut it like, a, what, two weeks well, no, before? Well, no, no. Woodstock, it was never going to be in the right. town of Woodstock. Right. It was going to be in a small town called Wallkill. And they found a spot. It wasn't perfect. They liked it. But it was a spot. And, you know, then the, the locals st started hearing about naked hippies. And, <laughs> and they started passing drugs. Uh, and drugs, of course. And they passed a, a couple of laws that really shut it. They said, the music you can play, okay, you can play the music, but it can't be heard from more than 10 feet from the side <laughs> of the, where the music's being played. Come on. Yeah, so and like all the kids would have to be arrested for that. 
<laughs> right. And then he said, if the most people you can have here is 5,000. So, yeah. I mean, they, they effectively said, no deal. Yeah. You know? And it almost ended up a half a million, right? Somewhere really close to that. Well, whatever the number was, if you take into consideration the people who were there and the people who were still trying to get there, that was considered the fourth biggest city in the state of New York. <laughs> for those three days. For those three days. I don't. Do you know Ed Mel? He's a he's a painter anyway. He's a really great painter. I didn't know this, but I had dinner with him a couple nights ago, and he goes and I and I were talking about Woodstock because it's the anniversary, right? And he was in New York. He was a great illustrator at that time. He goes, yeah, I I tried to go. He goes, I got there. He goes, we couldn't go any further. My brother went seven miles down to the to the concert and he says it's a sea of people we can't even you can't even hear the music and they turned around and left well they should have been able to, they had a really good sound system yeah that wasn't the reason you know what happened to me so i'm driving along thinking it's just another concert right and i get in this line of traffic that's moving about one mile an hour and i'm supposed to be there already are you coming in on a wednesday on friday oh you're, you're oh man you're coming in right well, at I, the end. I know. yeah so um <laughs> I was like, what do I do now? You know AAA maps? Yeah, sure. I had my AAA map with me back before there was Google Maps. Right. And I said, there's got to be another way around to this spot where they are. Right. And I, I looked at it. There was a parallel county road. I mean, really parallel. I took a left turn, then a right turn. And sped up there, and I was there in 20 minutes. <laughs> I mean, I'm, and uh, this is the other thing I, I don't often tell. As I got close, there was a motel there. I stopped and said, do you have any rooms? <laughs> they did. No way. Yes. Well, of course, most of these kids had no money at all, right? Well, but I mean, <laughs> even the ones with money had to stay. They had to camp, and they had to, and I had, you know, when things got bad, the rain came. I went back to so you got room. the hotel. Did you pay in advance so you made sure you had your hotel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> that was a very prime thing. And so you could get to that with your car? How, do, how would you get to that logistically? How would you get to I that? I drove to it because this back road, nobody was using it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, well, they left their cars 20, 5, 5, 10, 15, 20 miles away and walked the rest. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was just a line of cars, right? Yeah, it really was. So you were able to, so you show up on Friday. And who do you have to go report to at that time? That's, I have no idea. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know who I report to. <laughs> you're question. 30 at this time, right? You're at a 30-year-old. 30. So you're 32. one of the... 32. So you're one of the older people at this yeah. time. Well, I was, I was 30 when we started Rolling Stone. And, um, you know, at that time, you weren't supposed to trust anybody over 30. Right. But there I was. <laughs> The chief photographer, they better f trust me. In fact, we'll, we'll backtrack it right here yeah. because that's really kind of a critical component is that um, the fact that you were the, the photographer for Rolling Stones, right? Right. And so that happens in uh, you meet two people that were influential who were just getting ready to start that, right? So you, Ralph Gleason was one of them, right? And he yeah. was the San Francisco Chronicle... Jazz, uh, he was really the jazz critic as much as anything else, but he noticed that the music was changing in San Francisco and rock and roll was becoming pretty big, to say the least. Right. And, and so he started covering rock and roll. And he, he kind of became a mentor to Jan Wenner, who the titular head of Rolling Stone. And so and, we and he was young, right? He's a twenty-one year old kid, right? From right, Berkeley, and, exactly. Yeah, and that's Jan Winter. Jan. Jan Winter. So yeah, and uh, you know, he just said, he told me about the idea. It, it, what they had no name yet for it. Yeah, it was just an idea, and he told me about it, and I thought it was a good. He said, "What do you think? I think it's a good idea." He says, "Well, do you have ten grand to invest?" <laughs> I said, no, young, but I'll, sh I'll tell you what, I'll shoot for free in exchange for stock in the company. Well, there was no company, so obviously it was easy for him to say, okay. <laughs> but the one thing I did say that has stood me in good stead from that day forward was I said, Jan, you can use the pictures any way you want to, but I own them. And that's an impossibility right now. So 
for 50 years, well, I mean, I'm exaggerating for effect, but for 50 years, I've, I've lived off of the pictures I took in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, because they gave you access to all the names. I had access to all the bands, not only because of Rolling... Well, with Rolling Stone, in the beginning, we needed them as much as they needed us. Mm -hmm. Put it this way, they needed us as much as we needed them. So if they were disinclined to get their picture taken, they suddenly became inclined because they wanted to be in the pages of Rolling Stone. And that thing kind of shot off pretty quickly, didn't really it? Really quickly, really quickly. So you got stock, you got... Um, I, I got no money, I got But you got to keep man. all your photos. Yeah, yours. exactly. So that was in... I don't know what... I No, people said, well, you know, what possibly... Uh, cause you to make that condition. Yeah. And I thought back, I've been working for Time Inc., yes. you know, shooting for People Magazine, all that crap. And, uh, and it was crap. I, I told them I'd never shoot for them again because they, they were so, they had they lack compassion. In order to get, they said, you do anything, you get a picture, even oh, if yeah. it hurts somebody. Oh, I, said, I'm said not wow. I said, I'm not a carrying bird. I don't work for people like that. And they said, you'll never work for us again. You're right. <laughs> I will never work. Anyhow, blah, blah, blah. But when, when you work for time, back in the day, when you work for Time Inc., you had to give them all your film and everything. And essentially, they owned it. And I, I knew I was making really good pictures that they had, uh, I didn't have access to. So that's, I think in my mind, I was remembering that. And I said, yeah, I'm, I own the picture. Yeah, so you're just, when you work for time, they pay you out a fee and say, okay, you get this much for this shoot. And, yeah, and that's we, it. And that's then adios, oh, buddy. Yeah. Thanks for the great photos. I don't know if they steal that. Uh, it's, it's, gotten, it's gotten horrible. I mean, if, if you were a young person that came to me wanted to be a music photographer these days, I would dissuade you. I mean, you'd have a great time. You'd make no money. Yeah. Even the, even the pros make no money at this point. So let's go back. I actually want to go to the part where how you became a photographer because at some point when you were growing up, photos, something, art, photos, paintings struck you, I would bet. Yeah, um, two things. My cousin had a small speed graphic, which was a very cool photojournalist. Oh, no, I don't even think of photojournalists. Uh, you know, the <clears throat> photographers of the day, you remember, had that square speed graphic with a light bulb in it, yeah, and yeah. you'd shoot it, and you'd have to change the bulb. He had one of those. But with that, he just showing up with that camera, he could cross police lines yeah. and I it'd be where the action is. And I said, I want to be where the action uh -huh. is. So I got myself a camera, not the same kind. How old were you then? I was a young teenager. Yeah, teenage kid. A very young teenager, 13, maybe 14. Um, but here's the thing. my what, I mean, To this day, it persists, this idea. When I look at the world, I see a lot of chaos. Um, and in the broader sense of the word chaos, the way people handle themselves, the way they relate to each other, the way, what, the way they live their lives. And then accompanying the chaos is this noise. I can't explain it. It's psychological, psychic noise, which I always felt even as a kid. But I picked up the camera, and I looked through the viewfinder, and I could select the moments that had some meaning to me. And there went the chaos, and there went the noise, and it was almost therapeutic. And you know, I fell in love with the experience. And uh, <clears throat> I, you know, for, there'd be periods of time I'd put away the cameras, and I'd come back to them, and it was like a best friend. They were, it was always there. The experience of pa taking pictures was always built, you know, made my heart pound, filled me with delight. So that's, that's a story. How I became a professional photographer. I mean, this was a great hobby. You know, I could get girls to unbutton three, bu three, <laughs> three buttons on their butt. Right. Um, but uh, I was in Berlin working for our side as a counter spy. 
And so well, let's stop right there because that's pretty interesting. I'll tell you more. Yeah. About that. <laughs> um, but um, I was there when the wall was built, when it went up, and I started photographing what was happening. That's like 1960. Yeah, 61. Yeah. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I took pictures and I wrote my hometown newspaper. I said, "Look, there's local. I'm the local boy on the front lines of what could be the beginning of World War III." Would you like some pictures and a story? And they said, yes, and send us what you got. In those days, you couldn't transmit photos electronically. I made prints. I wrote a story. And you know what? They, wrote, they read the whole story, unedited, all the pictures, on the front page of the feature section, uh, one of the daily, or maybe it was a weekend, I don't know. And they sent me a check for $550, which in 1961 probably represented about $500. Yeah, so, and you're only like 21 or something. 22. Yeah. So I'm saying, wait a minute, <laughs> this hobby is paying me money. I'm just going to make it my profession. And that, that was really the beginning of it. And you're serving in the military at that time? Yeah. Yeah, as a counter spy. So let, so let me get back to that. What branch of the service was it? Is the Army, Army Intelligence. And see, here's what happened. When I graduated from Northwestern in 59, the war in Vietnam was, I mean, no, the war in Vietnam was just beginning to heat up, but the draft was still going on. And so if you, if you didn't go to graduate school or medical school or something like that, you'd get drafted after you, after you, you Got graduated college. college right? Yeah. However, the military had this program whereby if you gave them an extra year, um, you, you could avoid the draft, and you could, also, you could also choose the job that you had in the military. So I, and heard, the service, I guess, you could go. Whatever, and, yeah. And did, so which one were you in, the Air Force? I was in the Army. In the Army. And so um, I heard about military intelligence, <laughs> and I thought... Who wouldn't want to be a spy? Who wouldn't want to be a counter spy? That sounds like a lot of fun. Like with your little camera growing across the police <laughs> exactly, lines, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's what I did. And they sent me to language school to learn German uh -huh. in Monterey. They sent me to spy school to learn how to be a spy. And huh. then, then I ended up in Berlin. And so what was that like? What was spy school like? Well, or do you have to kill me if you tell me? Uh, <laughs> no, but I do have to. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I had another name. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, 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 counter spy name. A counter spy name. Which, to this day, I've never told anybody what it is. <laughs> and I won't. Don't ask. I'm not going to. I can yeah. tell. I can see in your eyes, and I'm not going to ask. Well, it, it actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it makes a good conversation. I see it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Anyhow, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so <laughs> they taught us interrogation techniques. They taught us how to how to follow people without being noticed. You know, that's super important as a photographer, though. That's what I mean. And the one thing they taught they taught us in the interrogation techniques, which became almost like a mantra for me, is that people's favorite subject is themselves. And if you get them talking about themselves, they'll tell you anything. Exactly. If they have a secret, they, yeah, if they have a secret that you want to know, all you have to do is ask them because, you know, they want to tell you. What was that name of the... Yeah, thing? exactly. <laughs> 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 well, how about... <laughs> you don't have to tell. Bruno. <laughs> there you go. You heard it here first. So uh, I was Bruno the spy. Went, I got it out of you. Bruno, you told me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no. So you did that for how many years? Two huh? years. And what was, was <clears> that? I mean, did you ever go? Maybe I should do this as a profession. No, they, they, the DEA was trying to recruit us after. I I'm mean, sure. Yeah, they wanted because we had experience and knew the kind of things that, but. No, who would want to be a member of the DEA? Come on. Yeah. You know, especially, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not against what they're against. Yeah. Um, so you're getting out of there at about but, 62? Yeah, but I'll tell you some of the funny, do you remember Mad Magazine? Of course, I've got okay. all of them. Okay, Spy versus Spy. Of course, okay. got those two. So I'll, I'll give you one example of why 
what we did was exactly spy versus spy. One day they sent me out on a deep cover, you know, some assignment. We want you to go check the blah, 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 deep cover. Take one of the cover cars, which was from the motor pool, which was a German car, of course. Yeah. You know, nobody would think twice. I go down there, the plates on the cover car said USA Army. <laughs> spy versus spy, man. Oh I, I laughed all the way to. So did you still go ahead and do it, even though you knew I your... did, I did. I knew I was made, but <laughs> I just went out because the best thing in those days was to get out of the office and go have fun in town. Yeah, it was know. Berlin, right? Yeah, yeah. It was Berlin. Was and go a... take photographs. And were you doing that that whole time, taking photographs? Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. It, something clicked for you on that. Yeah. No, it, it, was, it was an important experience. I didn't take as many as I should have. I never take as many as I should have. I mean, even with Rolling Stone, I tell pe they, people, say, that must have been a lot of fun. I said, it was so much fun. I was having so much. If I had realized how much fun it was, I would have taken twice or three times as many pictures. Well, you're in the moment, right, when you do those. Yeah. And you also have a job to do, right? Well, I had a job to do, and I also had a wife who was a professional ballet dancer. So I was down there taking pictures for the ballet half the time, which I enjoyed a lot, sure. too. You know? so, I mean, I wasn't sitting home doing nothing. Right. <laughs> no, you don't impress me as a man who's ever sat down and I do don't, that. I don't <laughs> sit around. And, I watch Formula One and NASCAR. I know everybody thinks I'm crazy yeah. to watch it. <laughs> to the left turn, left turn, left turn. And why do you think, you think that has to do with the imagery? Why is that? Why do you like this? Uh, well, I mean, look at me. I'm short and not strong, and, uh, but I like football. I work for the NFL. I shot pictures for the NFL because I love football. And uh, I was on a racing team because I like cars. And, you know, I mean, you know, I'm not passionate about either one or obsessed with either one. I'm curious about mm -hmm. this. Is the th this is what I discovered as an artist, as a photo photography, photojournalist. Um, if you're curious about something, you, f you satisfy your curiosity. You find out what you're curious about with a camera. And I would get assignments. I would, I would be curious about something and find somebody who would pay me to go do an assignment about the thing I was curious about. And so it was, I made money, I did my art, and I satisfied my curiosity. I mean, what more is there? Really, I met some incredible people along the way. And do you think that kind of thread kind of goes through the photojournalist community? I think photojournalists are much more humane. I mean, studio photographers are more technical. Uh, although I knew studio photography, actually my best studio work was for a series for Rolling Stone called The Groupies. Mm. I don't know if you've ever seen them. No, but I want to hear about it. Well, here's what happened. I would go backstage a lot, obviously, and uh, I, in, in San Francisco in particular. And I'd see these women. Now, you think of a groupie, you think of almost famous. It wasn't that. These women were there to show off, not to show how much style they had, to how unique they were, you know, how much creativity mm -hmm. they did with putting themselves together. And I said, I told you, and I said, I think, that, I think there's a story here. Mm. Um, I know that there, a lot of them are back there to sleep with the, the lead guitarist or something like that, but that's not the only reason they're there. And... Sometimes they knew more about music than the bands themselves. And in addition, what they wore inspired the bands to start dressing like, like they did. So I, I knew there was a story. And you and love style, too, right? You started a magazine. On, well, uh, it, yeah. we'll go to that. Okay. Yeah. But, um, so I recognized that they had style more than they had, more than they had lust. And so... I decided they, I, we, had, well, I, uh, as soon as I met him, I started bringing him to the studio and sh sh started shooting them as fashion models with great respect mm -hmm. and the best that I could give with the lighting and stuff like that. And so 
already I had started recording that. And when I showed you, and I said, here, take a look. This is what's going on. And so he said, I think we should do a story about it. Well, that story turned into a whole issue. Wow. And, and that and what, what, was it called Groupie Issue? The Groupie Issue. Everybody knows it. What and year was that? 68. Oh, yeah. And uh, it became a book. And one more thing. One day, you know, Jan and his wife and I and my wife, we were social fr friends. And so I took some pictures of my wife, some really cool pictures of my ex-wife. And I brought him into the office one day, and I said, here, take him to Janie, show, show what I did. And he did. No, he didn't. So um, my dark room was in my home because we didn't have room in the office for a photographer to sit and build the dark room or anything. So the issue was due out in two or three days. I came down to get my copies of the issue. She's on the cover. Your wife. That My you ex-wife. Uh -huh. yeah. The ballerina. Yeah. Uh -huh. Everybody said, who is that? And nobody knew why. It was just a very cool cover. But, <laughs> you know, for her whole life now, and we're still friends, she points out I was on the cover of Rolling Stone. Yeah, and she was probably famous for, kind of famous for a little while. Yeah, there, right? well, she is when she pulls that, even now. Yeah. She pulls out a cover and shows you. And it was just because she was so beautiful or the way you he, shot it or I, everything? Well, I asked you, and I said, what'd you do that? He said, I just like the picture. Yeah. In the beginning of Rolling Stone, we could do anything. It was free form, and anything was possible. We gave, the art director was um, a very talented cabinet maker, and he would turn these little handles mm -hmm. that, um, about like that, that he, under which he'd stick a alligator clip. We called them a handy little device. So I took the, the device and with very clear fishing wire, fishing, mm -hmm. yeah, line. fishing line, I hung it up and photographed it. We, whoops. Huh? we blew it up to the size of the page, the whole page, you know, and, and it, you know, then we said it was, this was the length. But we offered the handy little device to anybody who got a subscription. We filled out the subscription. That's how we promoted the, you know, the magazine in the beginning. And is that where the clip came for smoking marijuana? Was the little alligator clip? Yeah. yeah. Would well, you think that came directly from that? Give it away with Rolling Stone. Well, every that was one of the ways you held. <laughs> you had your joy, you know. And then I, I said, listen, I was. A, I was kind of the team photographer for the Oakland Raiders. I said, we should do a story on the Raiders. Then he assigned Hunter Thompson to do the story on the Raiders. Then my friend, father, started, invented the game of roller derby. Oh, yeah. You know, the bank oh, track. Yeah, not, no. the one, not the one that's been resurrect, resurrected by the women. I mean, it was a sport. And they skated two blocks away from my house. So I went down there and started, we did a story on roller derby. And when was that? When was roller derby? I, I'm thinking early 70s? Late 60s, early, early 70s. Yeah. Well, he founded it. He started in the 40s during the Depression. Um, people didn't have anything to do. And, and, you know, it was like a roller skating marathon. Yeah. And um, no, we I did it in public. And then, you know, concurrently with all this, because I became addicted to printer's ink, you know, where you, when you're around a printing press all the time, right. and addicted to the fact you have an idea if you can turn it into reality as a book or a magazine or something. So I started a, a small book publishing company, and we published a roller derby book. We published a lot of stuff. What other books did you do? Do you remember? Oh, yeah, we published. Well, some of them um, I published myself. Others... We, well, I forget the term is it. Uh, we had a relationship with a, a national publisher where we pr produce it. Mm -hmm. The first book, I think, was the Levi's Denim Art Contest. We, at the time, I, I was really good friends with the Levi's PR guy, and everybody was decorating their denim, you know. Yeah, I, said, we I should, remember that. Yeah, <laughs> let's have a contest. And so they, they had a contest, and they had to 
send it, everybody who entered the contest had to send a color transparency of themselves wearing whatever it was uh -huh. or their garment. So they sent them all in, and then we had a panel of judges. And then, so my company, publishing company, was called Square Books. Yeah. You know, it, because I was fascinated with what you could do with a square format. And of course, the corner is square. But, <laughs> so, but it really lent itself to the square transparency. Remember the, the Kodak trans, yeah. you, Kodachrome, Exochrome, yeah. you come back and it was a perfect square. Yeah. So what we did in that book, we, we, pub we printed the entire transparency, not just the transparency, but the, the mount. Mm -hmm. And so you saw it. The mount on the side. You saw the mount, right? In, right. No, the book was the shape of the mount. And inside the mount was the color photo. Yeah, so it gave an authenticity, which yeah, yeah, very much so. It was and huge. Who, who won the contest? You know, there's a guy who lives in Joshua Tree, and he's still making his stuff. My friend huh? knows him. Yeah, and he won it, and that kind of set him on his art path. It right, sounds like, right? No doubt. He's still doing. It. Do you remember his name? No. Yeah, that's interesting. Somebody will call in and let me know yeah. who it is sometime, or email. They don't call anymore. So you do the square books, and you're publishing your own. You're working for the NFL. And are you still doing all this time? Are you, are you, you work for the Rolling Stones for as their photographer? About, three, year, about right. three years. But they were using my pictures. And I would shoot music for another three years as a freelancer. So for six years, you're really in the scene of what's going on in this, the late 60s and the early Really, the, uh, the scene in the, in the broader sense. Music, style, politics, fashion, everything. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, it was all around you. It, it was like you, if you went into to a concert at the Fillmore West, mm -hmm. let's say you, you were against drugs, you got a contact high because there were so many people right. smoking that the room was filled with marijuana smoke. So, I mean, that's the way it was. We are living in the Haight-Ashbury. We were around all these creative counterculture people who were doing things. And... Was Were really you living there in 67, the summer of love, yeah. at Hate and Ashburn? Right. Well, not at the corner, but right. yeah, a no. block and a half off the Hate. Every day I'd go out and shoot more pictures, you know, of what was going on. So that's really important. That's an important event that happened. That's, you know. Absolutely. And have you done a book on those photos? Yeah, I've done a book on everything. Everything. <laughs> and when you go out to shoot something like that, because one of the things I, I've kind of gleaned from what, just reading the Woodstock book you came out with and looking at the pictures is you really like to get into the woods and, and see what's happening, not so much these studio shots, but things where people are, in whether it's what they've done or who they've done or how they're moving, there's, there's a, a sense of motion I almost feel when I see your photos. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's, it's like I said... Um, the studio is a very controlled environment. Life is an uncontrolled environment with a surprise around every corner. And if you're, and this is, well, we'll get to this and say, if you're a photographer, you're always looking for the ne next surprise. If you're focused on a subject, then, you know, you look for the surprises within the subject. Mm -hmm. But in general, just going on the street, you find all kinds of stuff. Um, there was something else I was going to say. I lost it. At my age, I'm constantly <laughs> losing thought. <laughs> and so when you were doing uh, The Summer of Love, you spent that whole, because it wasn't really that long. It was only a few months. But you were there shooting every day or almost every day? Pretty much. I, I mean, really, I was a block and a half off the hate street. So I walk out the door, and it's happening all around me. I walk into the panhandle of Golden Gate Park, there'll be a free concert. I walk into Golden Gate Park, there'll be a free concert. Uh, Quicksilver Messenger Service, they, what they would do, and this is, that was one band I photographed in the park, they would get a flatbed truck, park it in the park, put generators behind it, so they had something for their electric mm -hmm. you know, mu uh, instruments. 
and maybe not tell anybody that they were going to do it. Right. Just start playing. And, you know, it was like <laughs> the people swarmed. And it was fabulous. <laughs> and, but in those days, I could climb right up on the truck with them. I, there was n nowadays, everybody wants to be a music photographer. So nowadays, everybody wants to be a <laughs> thinks that he or she is a photographer. Hold on. Yeah, they they all think they're the photographer. Yeah, but they can go down to any camera store, spend five grand, and get a camera to do all the work for them. And they they think they're a photographer. Back in the day, there weren't that many people who wanted to do what we were doing, so we weren't seen as piranhas. Now, f music photographers are seen as piranhas, even though the best of them are actually helping the bands giving them really good pictures. I, I, I could talk about that forever, but I won't. Um, but on the other hand, what digital photography has done, and you were talking about it before, uh, alluding to it, is it is a lot of people who had never see, looked around and seen things. They never saw that pattern on that rug. Right. They never saw the pattern on this table. They suddenly, with their iPhone or their mobile phone, they looked through that, my God, that's a picture. And so it's, it, it, it's a source, it, it inspired creativity, yeah. that's what it did, these phones. And it ruined the profession of photography. But Because you know, everybody's a photographer now. Well, and that's the truth. I, I published a book about five years or so after I came to Santa Fe called Visions of Santa Fe. And I told people, if you got pictures of Santa Fe you love, send them in, and we're, we're going to make a book. And if they're good enough, we'll, you'll, we'll put them in the book. And it was amazing. Two things happened. Unbelievable pictures came in. I mean, vision that you and I wouldn't have thought about. And half of the photographers were women. And that blew me away. I realized that this digital photography was attracting creative women because they didn't have to go into a dark room. They didn't have to learn the same kind of things that I had to learn about how to develop film, how to print, make prints, how to make contact sheets, ASA, you know, shutter speed, aperture. You didn't, the camera did all the work. They were free to follow their creative impulses. Right, and didn't have to go through the male-dominated photography no. world, too. Right, yeah. and, and if you look around, some of the most creative photographers now are women. Yeah, well, of course, you always have the Annie Leibovitz and the Cindy well, Shermans. Don't of the mention Annie Leibovitz. <laughs> okay, I just did. I know, it pains me. Okay. I well. wish she were a nicer person. And here's the thing about it. When she followed me at Rolling Stone, she was doing wonderful work. I mean, she was capturing moments that were brilliant of, of what was happening in the pol political world and with a musician. Then she decided to create photos. She stylized them. She put Whoopi Goldberg in a, a, in a, what, a bathtub of milk. Yeah. What does that mean? You know? <laughs> and she lost, I feel, she lost that creative eye that I really respected and admired her for. Plus, she was not, and she is not a nice person. She really isn't. Bottom line, I don't mind saying that. Yeah, well, hey, that's what, to her say. well you, I mean, you know her. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> don't <laughs> waste your time. <laughs> well, no, she burned so many of my people. Yeah. She didn't pay them. She agreed to pay them, give them checks that bounced. And, I mean, she, anyhow, we, let's not talk about it Delete Andy from No, me. we won't delete. That's good. It's a, it's all good. At your age, do you care? I don't. Yeah, no, right? There's a point where you just say... No, is... if she wants to talk about it, call me up and we'll talk about yeah, it. I'll tell you, you how I feel. Could be a good thing, actually. It's really funny. The, the, somebody asked me the other day the, whether there was competition among us photographers, and there really wasn't. There wasn't enough of us to feel competitive. And by that time in my life... I had, I had this epiphany. Did I mention that the mm -hmm. other day? I had this epiphany. epiphany. Uh, I'm taking pictures. Of them and I, was, 
I don't know how it happened, but I realized I couldn't take every great photo in the world, period. Right. It was impossible. And so at that moment, I began to honor the people who were taking great photos just like I was. And I would compliment them. And I would see them not as competition, but as fellow travelers along this journey of documenting life, you know. You respected that eye. Huh? You respected their eye. Absolutely. Yeah. I did, and I respected them. So anyhow, one of my uh, colleagues was a crazy photographer called Jim Marshall. And he was, he had been photographing music his whole life. I went in and out. People don't realize that my uh, tour of duty doing music photos mm -hmm. specifically was very short. I'm, I'm so curious about everything else. I, you know, um, I bought an airplane because I, I'd gone up in the Goodyear blimp and we did a book about the Goodyear blimp, mm -hmm. but I went, uh, got, went up in the Goodyear blimp and I had to fly the damn thing. <laughs> and, but uh, they had no seat belts. You look down and you see the world from above. Way differently. Yeah, it is. And this was before drones and things. So I bought a pl an airplane, learned how to fly, and I'd fly myself around, open the window, put the plane in the bank, steer with my elbow, and take pictures from the air. So, you know, I mean, and then I joined that racing team, and I was a photographer on, the ra on this ra can -Am racing team. And I shot, you know, I couldn't, I wasn't big enough to play football, but I, I was where the action was on the field documenting the, the Oakland Raiders who were the bad boys. Yeah, and oh, I remember those, but they were bad then. Yeah. And John Metton, remember? Oh, of course. Kenny Stable is a snake. Oh, yeah, of course. That was the year. It was the best year to be. I was, listen, I have been so fortunate in my life. Yeah, um, remember Lou Gehrig when he retired? Sure. He said, you know, I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth, yeah. even though he knew he was going to yeah. die. I feel that way. I feel somehow blessed I don't, I don't, people say, oh, well, you deserve it. Nobody deserves <laughs> any of this stuff. Um, but I'm very, very grateful for being at the right place, the right time, having the talent and having, you know, the opportunities to do But you do still had to take those opportunities. You, right. know, you well, still had to go there. Well, you still had to find that road behind the Woodstock to get there. Right. You know? Well, here, here's, huh. here's the deal. I have a mantra. And I've changed it now as I get older, but my, my mantra was always say yes to every opportunity that comes along. If you say no before you know what you're saying no to, you might be missing the most wonderful opportunity that will come along in your life, right? You always can say no after the fact, so always say yes. But now I'm getting tired, <laughs> and I always, I, sometimes I have to say no because I just have... A limited, limited energy compared to yeah. You well, know. you said yes to this. Yeah. Yeah, and this, and you're under, and there's a lot of people want to talk to you right now because of the 50th anniversary. I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but I know. But you said yes because I it's know. The, I know. And now yes. we know your counter spy name. Right. <laughs> so, you shot pretty much all the grades, right? All the art, what? Not art? all of them. I only saw shot one beetle. Yeah. George Harrison. I didn't shoot Tom Petty. I really wanted to. I mean, there were bands that I would have liked to have shot. Um, but Harrison, the, you got to know, though, right? He, you get to know him in the process, but I, the only one I became somewhat friendly with was Steve Miller. You mm -hmm. know, Steve Miller. Yeah, of course. And he was a photographer, so we could talk about photography. My problem was, really was, a big problem, and I tried not to show it. Um, that I knew close to nothing about music, about chords and guitars and right. the instruments of the band. Um, in order to really connect with people, you have to know something about their lives so you can ask intelligent questions that shows, <laughs> that shows you understand the life they're leading. And that's, uh, like I told you before, once you do that, you make a connection, two things happen. They relax, and for, for my camera, they relax, and they give you moments that 
you didn't expect and stories that they generally don't tell anybody but their friends. Mm. So listen, you had to you had to learn some about the music. I had to. I and you know, now <clears throat> it's easy. You go to Google Wikipedia, <laughs> you find out everything right. you need to know and you know, I didn't Google you unfortunately today. No. I should have. <laughs> I'll tell you after the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the stories I heard the other when you were talking with John uh, Morris, who's a friend of mine, about uh, uh, Janis Joplin. I thought that was a fascinating story. Maybe you could share that where you had to do the shoot for her in color. Yeah. Well, Rolling Stone was printed for many years on newsprint. And for many years, the technology to print color on newsprint, no matter how fine the quality of newsprint it was, was not there. Mm -hmm. So we... We had we could we had to print black and white with we had what's called spot color. So, you know, we if the color had a red border, it sold better. Reds jumped out at you. If it had a purple border, it didn't sell as well. Anyhow, so all my shooting was done black and white. And once Rolling Stone got going, the the publishing world in New York saw that we were successful and, and began to understand there was money in the counterculture. So they decided they would, because they had the tools, they would print a big oversized full, full color magazine on glossy paper. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> this is how people know this is real. <laughs> so they printed this uh, full color magazine on glossy paper they called it I E Y E and um, covering pretty much the same stories that we covered so they called me and because we weren't getting paid a rolling stone they offered money so <laughs> of course you, t you take their work yeah, of course so they, <coughs> they wanted me to shoot Grace Slick and Janis Joplin and they, in particular, they wanted Janice in a performance color photo. I'd photographed her in color before, but not in performance. So she lived a couple of blocks away from me in the hate. And I called her up and I said, look, I need some color performance photos. Do you have anything coming up? So she didn't. I said, OK, I got an idea. Um, I'll set the studio lights up as if they're stage lights. You bring a microphone over and some music, the, you know, the, so you can lip sync it. We'll fool them. Yeah. Well, they'll think I got it on stage, and they won't know the difference. So she did. She brought the mic over, and she started lip syncing. But knowing Janice, you know, there was no way she wanted to lip sync. Not with that emotion. No, no. She wanted to sing. So she sang very quietly in the beginning and then louder and louder and louder. And she just got into it and started singing for an hour and <laughs> did her whole repertoire for me in that studio. <laughs> and if you see the pictures, you have no idea that was not on stage. That was Janice. Well, your, the hairs must have gone up on the back of your neck while she's doing that. Yeah. It was a gift. I mean, the musicians, once they trust you, and that's one of the things that's very important is to have trust from the person you're photographing. If you trust me, you're going to give me moments they, that are your best moments that will allow me to give you pictures of your best moments. And, you know... They'll let their guard down a little. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they want to be... The, the best they can be, if they respect you and they trust you, you know. And what was she like? You must have known her, to well, I mean, in a, in yeah, a in she was somewhat of a deeper way to, for her to do that for yeah, you. Yeah, she was an interesting woman. She had a dark side and a light side. She was not happy. Yeah, clearly. Um, she was really abused and, and psychologically abused as a kid and uh, had no self-esteem, even though people loved her, she never believed that. She never I integrated that love of, the, of her fans into her own psyche. And so but when I photographed her, I would 
wanted to get, she was only, what, 22, 23. I knew she, she was a young girl. I wanted to get that young girl picture. Mm -hmm. So I would say things to her that make her laugh. And, you know, this big smile would come out. And the, some of the pictures, I think there was one actually in the show yesterday. I had her sitting in the throne, kind of like yeah. with all this color and she had the big smile on her face. That's the Janice I remember. I know, but she was also capable of, very, of depression, darkness, and all that stuff. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, people come up to me. When, when I have a show, guys will come up to me. Listen, listen, man, I have a question, a personal question. I won't tell anybody, you know. <laughs> you just tell me. This is just between us. I say, oh, what's your question? <laughs> did, you, did you sleep with Janis Joplin? <laughs> so I say... What do you think? Uh -huh. And they say, oh, thank you, man. Thank you. <laughs> I won't tell you that. That's really good. So I've never said yes or no. I've said let them yeah, think right. yes or no. But because some of the photographs were taken, she was on her bed. And I was in her bedroom. Women in particular say, we know you, uh -huh. you slept with her because you were in her bedroom and how could you have not? <laughs> so th that's their take on it. Yeah. What they're saying is that if you had been with your camera in my bedroom, <laughs> you know we would have slept. Well, that's the intimacy of the camera, though. The camera, the camera, listen, you bring out a camera that looks semi-professional or professional, that's all you need, better than drugs. <laughs> yeah. uh, we had this show. One of the groupies that I photographed was so beautiful. I mean... Uh, I'm trying to think of the correct adjective. Alarmingly beautiful. Yeah, shockingly. Shockingly. I really, I mean, everything about her, the way she presented herself, was so beautiful. Anyhow, so about five years ago when the group people came out, we had a big show of the Prince and everything, and the groupies who were still alive, of which there are several, came to the show, of course. And she came up to me and she said, Baron, how come you didn't hit on me when we were shooting? Uh, as if, man, you missed your chance, you know. <laughs> you didn't know if you did. I, if, if you told me, Catherine, I might have. <laughs> but I said, you, look, I was 32 and you were 18. It didn't seem appropriate. Plus, uh, I'm a professional. I was there to take pictures, That's not, right. to, not to sleep with you. But I would have... <laughs> Well, one of the things that I th really interests me on <coughs> the wo your Woodstock adventure, let's just say, is that you had access to the stage, one of only two people to have access to take the photographs. And you're right there with Santana taking photos of him when it happened. Um, but you also, at some point during that concert, said, there's something more special, at least I'm, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but you can tell me if I am, but there's something more special about what's happening out in the... 500,000 people that are experiencing this, that this is a kind of a once in a lifetime to capture that. Maybe it's more important than the what's on the stage. You just answered your own question. Yeah. Because that's how I felt. Um, first of all, I photographed most of the bands. You did. At, uh, by yeah. then. Almost already every, before then. Before, yeah. before it sucked. And uh, I was getting to the point that I was bored with my own pictures of the bands the performing the performances of the bands um, because they they look too much alike and so be that as it may when I stood on the stage and looked out at, the, at that crowd I really recognized that okay the music was the catalyst that brought these people together there were two catalysts the music and the fact that they thought alike they were, as Michael Lang said, members of the tribe. Mm -hmm. These were counterculture people who had dreams about a world that could be, as opposed to the world the way it was, or violence and the way it is now. And so I thought, you know, this is not, I knew it would never happen again. It didn't happen, it was not planned, it was planned. But it wasn't well planned, and it wasn't planned for what happened. This thing was 
became an organism, right? It was. It, and it, 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 can, it was like a, a cauldron boiling up this wonderful experience. And I, I knew I had to photograph that. So I just pretty much wandered the crowd most of the time. It, even the movie um, itself, the wonderful Woodstock movie, Forty percent of the movie is about the people who were there because they recognized, okay, the musicians were important. They recognized that the people played as big a role in the, in the. I don't want to say, in the festival, in the experience yeah. of Woodstock, as the musicians did. And I felt that I knew. I didn't know that it would become a moment in history. Yeah. I don't think you can actually. No, I don't, and I never did. Uh, here's, here's what I wrote on the back that kind of summed things up. I said, Woodstock showed the world to... Th wait, I have to get my glasses on without you my glasses on. Glasses? Glasses? No, I know. That's right. Woodstock showed the world how things could have been. And for this reason, it's important that we never forget the ex this experience, this place, this time, this dream that came true, if only for three days. And that's how I felt. <laughs> and it was that, to me, it's that curiosity, you know, that you have. You know, clearly, you still have it. You had it since you were a kid. Yeah, and, I do. And, and I, I in the do. Army. Doing well, that. here's the thing. The curiosity is, is receded somewhat. Because I feel, there are times I think, and I've seen it all. I've seen war. I've seen sports. I've seen love. I've seen airplanes, I've seen, I haven't seen some reason I don't want to, <laughs> but you know, I've seen race, I've seen, it. I've seen so much of what life is, I've eaten great food, I've stayed in beautiful hotels, I've traveled to faraway places, you know, what, what is there to be curious about right now, for me personally, mm -hmm. and it, it's, a ch it's a challenge that I have for myself, because it's not that I'm bored, but I don't feel the fire in my belly anymore to go to be... I mean, I can tell you what's going on with the politicians. I can tell you why Syria is falling apart. I, can t I, I don't have to be there. I, uh, I'll tell you something funny. I, when I was doing the aerial for, for the photos, well, two things. I did Israel from the air, and I had to get permission from the Israeli government, mm -hmm. of course, to do to fly over Israel. I don't think they give it to me now, but I couldn't fly myself. I had to have a pilot, and um, oh, an Israeli pilot. And my cousin was the chief pilot at El Al, so that made it a little bit easier. Um, so we flew all around, and we went up to the Golan Heights. You know, the Trump thinks is now belongs to Israel, and. The pilot said, there's this beautiful ski mountain up there, and I wanted to get that. So he said, okay, we're going to go in quick and turn around and come back because if they think we're spying on them, right. they're going to shoot at right. us. And uh, I, I remember that. And I remember going, which was totally against all rules, the old city sits in the middle of Jerusalem. It's beautiful. It has a wall around it and stuff. The sun was setting, so I got the pilot to circle the old city a couple of times. Unbelievable photos. You couldn't get them today. You really couldn't. And was this like 81 kind of thing? Huh? Was this early 80s? Mid 80s. Yeah, mid 80s. Yeah. And then, um, what's the name of um, that one side up on the mountain? Oh, Mount Sinai? No, no. Um, well, another thing that was happening, you know, in the airplane, there's an altimeter, and it shows you how far above sea level you are. But the Dead Sea is below sea level. So we went down and cruised along the Dead Sea, and the, the altimeter was going uh -huh. backwards, huh? below uh -huh. sea level. Yeah. Uh, that had, did you do that just for that? Yeah, yeah. just for that. But Did you, you take a photo? I could. No, I took the photo, but that didn't. I mean, you could. You could have done. If I if I had an iPhone, I would have taken a you video. know a video of it. And do you still take photos? Yeah. Yeah. So you're still curious. Well, I I, I still take photos, but. Um, do you do it with your iPhone, or do you do it with your real? Both. Camera? Both. Both. Depends on what. 
you know how I feel at the moment. The iPhone is really so good now. Um, you know, they make feature movies with the iPhone. Yeah, sure. And you can you kind of tell the difference, but you kind of can. You can't. Um, I like the immediacy of the iPhone. I do. Too. You know, you can get the uh, mixing kind of photography. These just sec they're there and they're not. And if you don't have it right there with you, you're going to miss it. The thing about people say, I told them, I think I took about 750 photos at Woodstock. And they said, why didn't you take more? Come on, man. You know, <laughs> I had the film, but with, with film cameras, you have to be deliberate. You have 35 pictures in each roll. Right. You don't delete it. You don't delete, shoot, delete, shoot, delete. So I, w I was much more del deliberate in the photos. In the back of this book, the Woodstock book, yes. or the contacts. I looked at those, fantastic. Okay, and if you look at those, you'll see what I was thinking as I was walking along. And there are, most of them are perfectly... Composed, perfect. they are. They're, they're perfectly composed, but they, they have um, an editorial content. You know, I wasn't... What Today, these guys, they get on stage, they have this motor driver shoots... 10 frames a second. I mean, how can you miss getting a guitar like that? But you can still miss, I think. I think you do miss, actually, in well, some respect, because I looked through those contact ones. I looked at all of them, every yeah. one of them, because I could see the process that you were doing. And even when I shoot with my iPhone, a lot of times I don't take a photo. But you don't care. But, yeah. I mean, you get a photo, you don't get a photo, yeah. you don't care. You have to care. You have to care. Yeah. No, you have to care with film. Yeah. And so I can understand why you didn't shoot all your film. You were looking for the photos, the mm. images, the moments that you go, that's it. That's it. Or you kind of know there's something there. You may not know until you develop it, I guess. But you get, you get a sense that, you something, get a sense something, that I think something's I got it. happening. I mean, there's a picture in the woods of a deal going down. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, the people were... Yeah, no, I like that photo a lot. It's a good photo. Yeah, and because you can see the other the people in the back that are looking, you can see kind of the deal. The guy who's making the deal is like focused on the deal. Yeah, I know. You know, and the guy who's He's giving like a, him money is focused. Yeah, they're, 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 you can see, it. and the other people are like, uh, uh. yeah. And when you took, but they, when you were taking those photos, people, I assume, were pretty much kind of just a, oblivious to some extent. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm small and I blend in the background. Do you have long hair then? Longer, or you yeah. saw the picture of me yeah. on stage. Okay, yeah, that's I right. I did see it. More hair. Yeah, yeah, it was very bold hair, actually. Yeah. <laughs> bold. <laughs> so but that helps, I think, too. If you had I think short that hair, and I think every everybody, by the time I was wandering around the crowd, they they'd all tr begun to trust one another, help one another. They they felt as though they were one big family, uh, including the photographers. And they had what eighteen cinematographers there. Yeah, they trusted them too. Thank goodness. I thought it was interesting. The cover of this book is the is the crowds, and I I think some of the most interesting in in a weird way was just that sea of humanity. Yeah, I mean. It had to be something it, to be standing on that stage and well, just... Well, I looked down. You could hear it breathe almost. Well, and, and there this show that I just did in L.A., the, he blew the, that photo of the crowd scene up to as wide as this room. Oh my. And you stand in front of it. First of all, extraordinary detail from a little 35 millimeter negative. But you, and they were still clean. The rains hadn't come or anything. Um... But you look and you say, what if I have to go pee? How do I get out of this crowd? Yeah. And how do I get back? How do I find my way back? You know, it was, I mean, really. Yeah, what did well, you look do? At, look at this. <laughs> how's, how's that guy going to go to the porta potties and find his way back? He may not. And he may not. Yeah, they probably, maybe when they got back home. Yeah. Because most of these kids, when you look at that, those pictures, and I look very closely, they all seem to be, you know, kind of 16 to 24 kind of mid age. mid teens to mid 20s. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. And the and the other thing that shocked me looking at those photographs, you don't see any logos. You don't see well, they're that's just what I meant. I, uh, no, there were no branded t-shirts at all. 
There were no branded sneakers. No, people were wearing sandals. Nobody wore Adidas or any of those, you know, running shoes. That hadn't happened yet. The other thing that you, you have to remember, as chaotic as this thing was, and as successful as it was, it put it it showed the professional promoters what they could do with big crowds. That they could have big crowds, make big money, put on big festivals. And um, some of the festivals after this were successful without violence. This had no violence whatsoever. And some of them had less violence. You know, nobody, nobody was like Woodstock with no violence. And when you <laughs> experience something like this, it's three days, and one of the days is, is just torrential rains, right? Yeah. Is that, is, was there a point you go, hey, man, <laughs> maybe I should go back to that hotel? And I did. Yeah, okay, yeah, I would think you would. No, I, you know. I, I shot in the rain for a while, and then I said, why am I staying out here? They, I mean, John and everybody was saying, you know, that tower might fall, fall over. The le electrical wires, you might be Killed. You know, electrocuted. I said, I'm not me. I'm <laughs> here. I'm not a com. I realize I'm not a combat photographer. During the demonstrations in San Francisco during those the years of the 60s, I wouldn't go where there was violence about to break up, break out. I learned in the military that where we had to, you know, go under barbed wire with live fire going on, going over us, really bullets. I realized you cannot have a conversation with a bullet coming to you, <laughs> asking that bullet to, to move. move. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> so, I mean, there are, there are photographers that are addicted to the, being embedded yeah, and they like it. violence all around them. They get great photos, but... That's not me, man. Yeah, that's not you. No, I mean, the most violence I have is the marsh pit, you know. <laughs> and were there any specific kind of moments or photos that stick out in that time frame from that shoot? For, shoot? From for Woodside, you? For yeah. Woodside. Yeah, just for Woodside. Well, the, the one, one is very powerful. Well, two. two. Um, they never got all the fences up, but they got a lot of fences up. But I got in a picture of a crowd before it was called before they decided it was going to be a free a free concert pushing over the fence on friday probably i friday or early saturday yeah. or something i mean and there were the people kept coming you know and they were not going to be denied so they, they i mean they were just simple cyclone fences right. but there was a guy on the police force because he had you know, please do this, please don't do that. He had one of the official shirts on, standing by and watching them, realizing he couldn't tell them not to do that. They were going to push it. There were so many, they were going to push it over. So that was one, that was an important moment. That was before John said, okay, it's yeah, going to be a free, free concert. Yeah. And another one was, he was alluding to the arrival of the National Guard Hueys. And one landed. They, they, they were really um, medevac helicopters. Yeah. They weren't there for any other reason yeah. to spray, you know, bullets or no, they would take gas. out people that cut their feet and yeah, all that kind of exactly. stuff. Yeah, exactly. And again, that helicopter had landed, and standing there helping people get on it were these guys with these official Woodstock shirts on with a logo on it. And... Uh, uh, that's really that was really a meaningful moment to me, because I knew how the military felt about long hairs and counterculture, and I know how the counterculture felt about the military, and yet here they were working together, and it se and that seemed to me to characterize this whole experience because we're all from the same con country, and why shouldn't we be working together, helping one another? And everything that John and those people said about it, you have to help each other, help one another here, we'll get through all of this. 
Even the military came to help. That encapsulated yeah. it. You could see it right there. And having been in the military, you understood yeah, that I as well. That. Yeah, I, I looked at that photograph for quite a while, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it is very interesting. And it does. It tells a story, right? That's what, <laughs> that's what I hope many of the photos do. Yeah, well, I think they all do. But some really, I mean, when I see them, I can almost feel the insight of what you're doing behind that camera at that moment. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you're intuitive, so it <laughs> comes easy to you, right? <laughs> well, I look at art all the time. Yeah. Right? And I take photos myself. So. Then you know. But yeah, but it's yeah, it's different. You do it for a living. I don't think there were. I don't. I looked at the pictures I took, and I don't think there were any lucky photos. No, there's I no was, lucky photos. Yeah. There. No, I guarantee you. Yeah. I looked at them all, <laughs> and the context used. Yeah. <laughs> and I, was, I worked my ass off on that. I really did, and I was proud uh, of what I got. There's one really funny photo. I think it's in here. Um, either they were also, a lot of the young young people were swimming naked in the pond. Right. But here walks this photographer in nice a photojournalism guy. jacket into the water with his clothes on, shooting naked people. I thought that, in a way, is kind of speaks to what I've been doing in my whole life, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. Not Well, I'll tell you how else it does, is that um, I call myself an observational photographer. I don't want to be in the action. I want to record the action. My friend Jim Marshall, as you heard me say, he was a participatory photographer. I have a friend, Michael Zagaris, who's a participatory photographer. If something is happening that he's photographing, he wants to be part of that happening. Michael, for example, is a team photographer for both the Oakland A's and the San Francisco 40, 49ers. He dresses with the team. He calls the team members us, we. It's just like that. He's also a white guy who thinks he's a black guy when he gets around the black guys, and the brother. Yeah. A, and he starts talking like a brother. Yeah. And he actually has great affinity for everything and everybody he shoots. But he connects with them in a different way than I do. I'm, I'm looking at objectively. He's looking. Right. He know. becomes part of the tribe. You're he, photographing the he, tribe. Just like Jim Marshall. Yeah. More Michael more than Jim, actually. M Jim did it with the drugs. And the fact that Jim t was there three days, totally stoned, taking pictures, and that every photo was perfectly exposed and perfectly in focus boggles my mind. Uh -huh. How did that happen? Yeah. How did it? Just a professional, I guess. It, well, not only that, I would bring out my, there were times I'd bring out my light meter to measure the light. And he, he'd say, 125th of five sick, Baron. Don't forget about your fucking light meter. <laughs> and he was right. That's, that would be the reading I'd get on the light meter. He had, he yeah, had, he had it. Yeah, in, yeah. innate sense. Yeah, of he had innate sense. Light. And so you've done a lot with your life, but it's not just Woodstock and NFL. And you also did this, ma you also did this magazine on fashion, right? Yeah, rags. We called it the Rolling Stone of Fashion. Um, because what we saw, what was really evident to me was that the change in ideas, the change in perception of society and things like that was, was noticeable. I mean, guys were wearing their hair long. Women were putting on flowery dresses or no dresses. I mean, what, what the young people were doing was what they were thinking it was, was unique, too. What, it was unique, but it was evident in how they presented themselves to the world. And uh, so these two women came to me, one from Vogue, one from Harper's Bazaar, the one to start a magazine that his point of view was that true fashion starts in the street and works its way up into the design studios where it's interpreted by the famous designer, and they put it in the store windows. And that was what we believed. And we were really very su successful, except we ran into 
mean, we only published 30, 13 issues. We ran into a, a recession. The advertisers weren't paying their bills. The distributors weren't paying their bills. I funded most of the magazine from the stock that I had sold in Rolling Stone, and I got an investors like yourself who put in a couple thousand bucks each, and I ran out of time and I'm well, time and money, mm -hmm. and the w month that we shut down, Levi Strauss gave us a, a twelve issue contract for the back page of that magazine. I mean, I think about that. That would have taken us through. We would have. We would have been really, really, but we were. But it just up came too late. It came too late. We were on TV all the time. Time Magazine did a story about us. What was the name of the magazine? Your magazine. Rags. Yeah, it was Rag, right? Yeah. And uh, Women's Wear Daily ch saw what we were doing and how important what we were doing was. They changed their whole approach to fashion because of us. So, you know. What year was that? 70, 71. Oh, yeah, super early. Yeah, yeah you were it. Yeah. I mean, really, we did, the we did the, the first article I ever saw about body adornment, tattoos, and stuff like that. Nobody else was doing that. We did the first story about shaved heads. Nobody else was doing that. Wow. Well, I mean, if you look at the magazine now, you, your mind would be blown. We had what was called the Rags Road Test, where we were con like consumer reports, right? So everybody, many companies were making jeans in those days, not the fashion jeans that are already torn and shit like that. Sorry. That's okay. But so we wanted to see which of the jeans were the best. So first thing we knew, if you went to a party and you drank wine and beer and stuff like that, um, you get all of your jeans. So we soaked, f I think we had Lee's, we had Levi's, we had Wrangler's, we right. had a bunch of them. We soaked them in a barrel of wine and beer yeah. to make <laughs> them filthy. And then we, saw, we tried to figure out which one got the cleanest uh -huh. after an hour. And, it, so. <laughs> and then we wanted to see how strong they were. Now, Levi's, if you notice, on the back are these two horses pulling. Yes, right. Yeah. 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 Pulling the Levi's yes, right. apart. So we got two beetles. We tied the, <laughs> <laughs> the Volkswagen. Yeah, right. We tied the, the jeans to the Volkswagen to see which ones would rip first. You know, we had a stopwatch. Volkswagen doesn't yeah. have a lot of energy either. Did, did, <laughs> did the jeans, did the Levi's rip? They, they, they all held pretty well, actually. Yeah, I would yeah. think. <laughs> did you take a photo of it? Oh, yeah, we had yeah. photos and everything. We did a big story on tie dye because tie-dye was really big then. And uh, no, I, listen, my life has been so much fun. There was, um, and I was displaying my work, my rock and roll work permanently at a winery in the Napa Valley. So um, for the 25th anniversary of Woodstock, we decided to have this event called Wine Stock. <laughs> and the invitations went out and said, Black tie dye optional, <laughs> and you had to, <clears throat> you had to pay. We had a big dinner. We had we had donations of the finest wine from all over the valley, and we auctioned them off for the Napa Valley AIDS Foundation. Now, what happened was really, I mean, to this day, it was everybody knows how successful that was. So, my friend was the the head of the collection at the Hard Rock, and he decided he wanted to come. He came with a blank checkbook. He, the, the bidding would start, he'd keep it going up until he bought everything, and people <laughs> said, wait, wait, let some of us have some, <laughs> you know, get some of this wine. It was hugely successful. And did people come in <clears throat> tie-dyed uh, suits, I everything. assume? I yeah. mean, you wouldn't have believed it. And then, then we had... Custom tie dye tablecloths. Uh -huh. I think there were eight, six or eight people plates out at the table, and under one plate would have been a star. And if you got the star, you got to take home the, the tie dye shirt, oh, the yeah. tie dye tablecloth. And you're taking photos, I hope. 
I don't know if I didn't do that. Or I might we, have missed that. There was a lot of wine. <laughs> and yeah, and we had Big Brother and the holding company came with the current Janice. Yeah. I mean, you know, the the Janice the subsequent Janices rotated and whoever could sing like Janice right. they would hire. And it was everybody dancing. It was really <laughs> it was great. <laughs> oh, man, I've had a good life. I had a heart attack two years ago, and as I was coming out of the anesthesia, I wasn't sure if I was alive or dead. And I thought, well, if I'm dead, it doesn't really matter. I, I have no regrets. I've had a hell of a life, so I'm dead. You know? <laughs> and then I woke up, <laughs> and, and said, here I am. And here we are. We keep going. Yeah, so it really has been... Thank you for talking to me. I'm oh, really yeah, no, it. this has been fantastic. Yeah. You know, we should all live a life like you. You know, that's it. I mean, and it's all about creativity. You've, that's been at the highlight of what you've done, trying to make a difference, which you have. And, uh, you know, hopefully things like this podcast and people can go back. And photographers, young photographers, I think, can come and look and see, you know, what the, the, what the, you know, the, the building blocks of where they are was on people like yourself. And before that, maybe people like Dorothea Lange. You know, and uh, yeah, it's it's cool, man. And they've got the tools now. They can, there's no excuse not to do it. Yeah. Uh, do you have advice for any of those people out there that want to go into photography and say, "This is it. This is what I want to do." Well, if you want to be a photographer, you know it. Yeah. And you're obsessed with it. And you're passionate about it. Don't let that passion, that obsession, get diluted. Follow through. If you want to make a living out of it, that's another question entirely. Yeah. It's very difficult now. Um, here, here's the, one of the problems I run into. I made a pretty good living for the past, not recently, previously for about 10 years, selling prints of my work. But since, with the advent of digital, and in particular the mobile phone, there has been... a, a increasingly, well, there's been increasing disrespect for the image itself. You might see in the New York Times, for example, online, you might see a fabulous photo. And I want to show you that fabulous photo. Fifteen minutes later, it's gone. The, when, when you and I were growing up, we learned about the world f through the wonderful photos that Life magazine published. Right. And we could go back and look at them and look at them. Can't do that anymore. Yeah, that's mean, true. It, right. And so people don't honor the individual image. They don't buy them to remind them, put them on the wall to remind themselves, unless it's a celebrity that they love or something like that. Really, that still goes on. But it's a... Yeah, and those, and sometimes those single individual images can be the one thing that makes somebody go, I've got to do this for the rest of my life. Listen, I met, I did, we did a show in Italy, and uh, the moderator of the conversation like we're having now in front of an audience was a well-known uh, writer for one of the major papers in Italy, in Milan or Rome or something like that. And he said when he at age 15 or 13 or 15 or something like that, he saw the Woodstock film. He said his life was changed forever. Yeah, I believe it. And that's what I think Woodstock brought to yeah. the people. <laughs> we got to end it on that. That's too good, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, you. that's your legacy, that kind of stuff right there. You, cha you, you change people's lives. Thank you. One of my favorites ever. Thank you so much for taking the time. Happy 50th uh, anniversary. This is the book. Where can they get this book, by the way? It's, it's out of print. There's no way? You can get them from How about me. your photographs? Where can they get your, buy your photographs for those people? Well, there are a million places. <laughs> yeah? Is there best, best way to contact me. And if there's a gallery near where you live, I'll turn you on to the gallery. But... Um, my w website is baronwalman.com. Yeah, just so your name. Yeah, you go to the website, you'll see a lot of cool pictures. And Instagram in particular, at, at baronwalman. 
I just did a book of my Instagram rock and roll photos. Oh, very cool. I'll yeah, start following they, that right now. Huh? I'm going to follow that myself. Yeah. Your Instagram should, account. I mean, really. The picture I put of the, uh, well, this is my plan. I don't know if anybody, by the time the people hear the podcast, the plan will have been put into effect. Huh. But right now, there's the, those people that were walking to Woodstock, that photo yes, with right. the guy and the two girls. I put that one up, and I put the first three lines of Johnny Mitchell's. You know, I came Song, upon yep. it. Where are you going? And, said, and so the next one is, there'll be a big, um, uh, uh, it's the, one of the crowd shots. By the time we got to Woodstock, we were m a half a million strong. So then, we, I mean, the response has been phenomenal. I'm getting followers that, that I never knew, that I didn't know or knew about me. You know? <laughs> so, well, well, a lot of people know about you, and I think a lot of people, a lot more people are going to know about you after this anniversary. Thank you. Yeah. What do I owe you? <laughs> How much do I owe you? <laughs> you owe me nothing, man. I bought the book. I love it, and you inscribed it. it. Well, the book that you bought yeah. came, and I do have more copies of that, comes with a print. Yeah, I saw it. It's and the cow it, picture. The cow picture and uh, the original admission ticket. I mean, uh, an actual. It's an. It's My a, problem is I want to frame that, but it probably hurts the value of the book. No, not really. <laughs> no, I can order another one from you. Well, you can order a ticket <laughs> from me too. I know a guy's got fifty tickets. Wow. Yeah, wow. but the tickets are. Uh, they're, they're really. Um, there's something about the ticket when you read it. What was it? Six dollars a day. Yeah. <laughs> I I did a I did I shot when I was shooting rock and roll. Bill Graham produces these concerts called Day on the Green in the Oakland Coliseum, and he had the Rolling Stones, he had Santana, he had Peter Tosh, and I think Journey that day. Tickets were twelve dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's changed. I, know, I can't yeah. even get parking for that now. Well, you, not even. Yeah. That's what it costs you to take public transportation. Um, for me, when I saw that the business of music became more important than music itself, something the innocence was lost for me, and that was also when the band, not the bands themselves, but the managers and the PR people started limiting our access. And as a photographer, access is everything. If you can get where things are happening, you can get the great pictures. Right. But if they say no. Yeah, you can't get it. No. Yeah. So anyhow, but right. we could go on forever, you know. Yeah, we have. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right, I'll let you go home. You probably got a ton of stuff to do. I have a ton. Yeah, I know. Thank you. All right.